There's a lot of people. Why am I being unmuted? Hello. Good evening, everybody. Hi. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Hello. Happy Pink Thursday, everyone. <laughs> Hi. 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 Hi, everybody. Once Hello. Hello. Hold on. Hi. Hi. I can't hear you. Sometimes okay. you're going in and out. Your voice is going in and out sometimes. Oh. <laughs> Maybe because I stopped talking. <laughs> Your lips were moving, but we couldn't hear. Uh oh, how about now? Yes. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> Great. Thank you. Okay. Admit. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Great Pink Chalabek. My name is Hana Kaplan. I co direct Chabad Potomac Village and the Friendship Circle. As far as I know, I think this may be one of the largest. Zoom challah bakes out there. And that is all thanks to all of you out there for coming out. Well, I should say coming in and join and supporting this cause. I would like to welcome my fellow Chabad Rebbitson colleagues and friends whom I call family. I would like to welcome the director, Hindi Light of Chabad of Anne Arundel County. Yeah. Hindi, you there? We, we, we did a big wave. You didn't see us? I don't think she can I see us. <laughs> oh, there we are. We're there. Hi. Oh, again. Hi. Hi. Okay. I would like to welcome now Chabad. Hi. Hi. Leia Deitch, Chabad of Tyson's Corner. Beautiful. Yay. Hi. Beautiful. I would like to welcome my colleague Freda Raskin from Chabad of Aspen Hill. Hi, welcome. Wonderful. I see a guitar on Zahava Pinson. I would like to welcome Chaya Bulbovsky. Chabad of Silver Spring. Hi. Chaya Silver Spring. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Woo! Hello. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> I would like to welcome Sarah Blooming and Hani Kagan, Chabad of Potomac. Welcome. So great to see all the Potomac crowd. 
Can we see Sarah? All right. I would like to welcome Mushka Minkowitz, Chabad of Chevy Chase. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. Hi, Chevy Chase friends. Hi, Mushka. I would like to welcome, Mushka, we didn't see you, but we'll see you soon. I'd like to welcome Nachami Gaizinski, Chabad of Bethesda. Hello, everybody. Welcome to all our ladies here. Hi, Nachami. I would like to welcome Chana and Chana Le Reichik, Chabad of Upper Montgomery County. Hey, welcome everyone. So good to see you all. I would like to welcome Goldie Pearlstein, Chabad of Greater Gainesville and Manassas. Hello, welcome everyone. I would like to welcome Sarah Beich, Chabad Israeli Center, Rockville. And I would like to thank Leah Deitch. I don't know if we said that in the beginning, Chabad at Tyson's Corner. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our co-sponsors for tonight, my dear friend, Jamie and J.R. Shugel. Woo! And of course, thank you all for joining us together in helping support Shar Sherrod, an incredible Jewish organization that helps women going through breast cancer and other cancers as well. Thank you. I would also like, I'm going to ask you now to Keep your attention, not turn your attention because we're in one spot, to this short video whose message is so relevant to the time we find ourselves in right now. Enjoy. I have no sound. I don't have sound either. We don't have sound either. What is a Zoom event without, you know, tech issues? We're going to get the sound up in just one moment. Thank you for bearing with us. You know, I think it's a rule. There's no tech issues. It's not a Zoom event. We want to give you the feeling. Of <laughs> Thank you for your patience. I can't hear you. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. now I can. I was just kidding. Okay. Dedicated to all those around the world suffering the impact of coronavirus. May God bring miraculous healing to all those who are ill, comfort those in mourning, and provide ample livelihood for all. You want to put on a movie or something? The world is fighting a war, not against an army, air force, or navy, against an enemy so minuscule it's unseen to the naked eye. Yet it wields an inordinate power that brought our economy to its knees, closed our schools and businesses, and brought life as we knew it to a halt. We found ourselves cornered in a world that shrunk to the footprint of our homes, For 2,000 years, our synagogues, study halls, and Jewish schools served as the epicenter of Jewish life. But they too were not spared and were forced to close their doors. Where would we find God now? God's intent in creation was for sanctity to move beyond its natural boundaries of the synagogue to permeate every aspect of life, and especially the most personal spaces of our homes. As Jewish women, we have the power and the tools to transform our homes into a personal temple. We bathe our homes with spiritual warmth and nourish the souls and minds of our households with the beautiful traditions that have kept our people for millennia. Specifically, the three special mitzvot of the Jewish woman the mitzvah of challah. When we separate a piece of dough before baking bread, symbolizing our responsibility to share our goodness with others, 
we impart the message that whatever we may have must first be used in the service of God towards fulfilling our mission on earth. The timeless mitzvah of mikvah infuses our most intimate life with sanctity and purpose, bringing stability and blessing to our family life and offspring. And the far-reaching effect of Shabbat candles, their physical light is but a faint glimmer of their true power to utterly transform and sanctify our families and homes. They remind us of who we are and how even the smallest light can vanquish the greatest darkness. A tiny virus can try to stamp out our light, but if thousands of years of history is any indication, the light of the Shabbat candle will always triumph. Let us recommit ourselves to use our unique feminine power to fill our homes with Torah and mitzvot, bringing much needed light to the world around us. All right, now is the time we've all been waiting for. We are going to be starting our challah dough. And the first thing we have to do in order to make the dough, that's actually the most important part of challah, otherwise it's just a regular dough, is to start with our yeast, which allows the challah to rise. So we're gonna start off with one cup of warm water. And you're going to pour it right into your bowl. One cup of warm water. Pour it right into your bowl. You have your warm water. And then you're going to take your packet of yeast that you got. That packet has two teaspoons and a quarter teaspoon inside of your packet. So if you don't have a packet and you're making your own ingredients, taking your own ingredients, that's the measurements. So one packet of your yeast can go right inside that warm water mixture. And to help activate and proof the yeast, you're going to use a little bit of the sugar that you got in your packet. So you have a quarter of a cup of sugar inside your kit. You're gonna take a little bit of that, about a tablespoon, and add that to your yeast mixture. So now you have warm water, a packet of yeast, and a, pa uh, and a tablespoon of sugar. And you're just gonna give it a gentle stir once or twice, and that's it. Wait. Excuse me, somebody wanted you to repeat the measurements of the yeast. Absolutely. So you're going to take two teaspoons and a quarter teaspoon inside your cup of warm water. And you're also going to add a tablespoon of sugar. So you're going to have a cup of warm water, two teaspoons and one quarter teaspoon and one of yeast and one tablespoon of sugar. You're going to give a gentle stir and let that be. What you want to now see in a few minutes is your yeast starting to activate. Once you see your yeast activating, you know it's ready to go and you're gonna start your dough. Excuse me one more moment. Um, I know you're not seeing the chat, so I'm telling you what it says. Somebody asks that you slow down a little. Of course. So we're gonna take a cup of warm water, two teaspoons and a quarter teaspoon of yeast, one tablespoon of sugar, pour it into your bowl and give it a gentle stir. And just like that, leave it right there and watch the magic start. I now like to call upon Sarah Blooming, co-director of Chabad Potomac. Hi everybody, it's great to see everyone. Um, before we begin actually making, we, we started the dough, but you have your Tadaka box that came in your kit. Um, you can put a coin in now or after, but it's a custom before we begin cooking to put a coin in the Tadaka box to show that we care and we, we think about others who are less needy than us before we begin our cooking. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge all the breast cancer survivors who are on the Zoom. Unfortunately, there are many. You live with a heightened sense and a greater appreciation of the preciousness of life and the gift of every day. You are an inspiration to all of us on how to dig deep and discover our inner strength and faith to weather the most difficult storms of life. I join everyone here in blessing all of you with complete health and many more happy and healthy years ahead. L'chaim. Have you ever wanted something so badly that it touches you to the core? Perhaps it was the blessing for a child, 
or good news from the doctor, or perhaps to find the right one to marry. Over 3,000 years ago lived a woman named Chana, and she wanted something so deeply. She yearned for a child, for the blessing of motherhood. She wanted it so much that it touched her to the core, and she did what happens when something touches our core so deeply. She prayed. To paraphrase the Torah's words, Hannah was bitter in spirit, and she prayed to the Lord, weeping profusely. And she said, Lord of the hosts, look upon my affliction. Remember me. Do not forget me. Please give me a child. And it was, as she continued to pray before the Lord, Hannah was speaking to her heart, and only her lips were moving, and her voice was not heard. She told Ailey the priest, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit, and I have poured out my soul before the Lord. In the Hebrew, it's Va'eshpo Hasnavshi Lufnei Hashem. Hannah's heartfelt prayer was so raw and so sincere that until today, Hannah remains the paradigm of prayer. In fact, the Talmud in Brachel 30b quotes, Rabbi Hamnuna said, how many important laws of prayer can we learn from the verses of Hannah? We are all that Hannah. We all have things that we yearn for and that touch us deeply. So deeply that we cry out to God from the depths of our hearts, just as Hannah did. The Torah makes a point of telling us that Hannah's prayer was silent. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. We struggle to find the words to say to God because it is so painful and so overwhelming. And yet as long as we open our hearts, we know that God listens and he understands the feeling within our hearts. When a woman is battling breast cancer, she needs our support. This support can take on many forms, whether it be providing meals, assisting with transportation for treatments, sending thoughtful texts, etc. But there's something else that's just as important that we can do to support those who are battling this terrible illness. We can pray for them, as in Hannah's form of prayer, a heartfelt, cry from the soul type of prayer. We can open our hearts to God and beseech him to grant our loved ones complete healing and the strength to get to that point. Ladies, we are, what's the number now? We are 300 ladies strong, now that's power. Let's tap into our feminine power of prayer to really open our hearts and communicate to God as Hannah did, asking him to send complete healing to all. In the merit of the incredible unity we are experiencing here tonight, may we merit the ultimate era of peace and healing, the time of Mashiach. I now turn the floor to Mushka Minkwitz, co-director of Chabad of Chevy Chase, who will lead us in making the Chalado. All right, who is ready to get their hands dirty, get inside our dough, what we've been waiting for. So, um, right here we have our bowl with um, our yeast and our water. Um, it should be slightly bubbling. Um, it, it may be still working its way, um, but we're gonna get moving on our ingredients and it will continue to, um, to do its magic. So we're gonna start with our one egg that we had to bring from home. <laughs> um, now with our egg, when we make anything kosher, um, just like with uh, when, we, when we have kosher meat, we have to salt it first. And that is in order to remove the blood from the meat. So we have the same rule when it comes to an egg, just a whole lot easier. We don't need you guys salting meat. We need you to crack your egg, check your egg, make sure that there's no, there are no blood spots. And then it's a kosher egg to use inside your chaldu. Can you do this whenever you use eggs? And that simply makes our egg kosher. So I'm gonna crack my egg, check it. Mine's good, how's yours? Okay, then we're going to give our egg a little mix and we're ready to pour it inside into our bowl. Next we have, so we'll give you all a minute to crack your eggs put them inside your bowl together with your yeast. Oh, I see it moving around. You might, if you look at your yeast, you might see, see it moving on its own. So that's, that's a good sign. All right, we'll give everybody another second and we'll move on to the next ingredient. How many eggs? We need one egg. Okay. Next, we're going to take our um, oil. Um, you're gonna measure a quarter of a cup. 
I already measured mine. So here's my quarter cup of oil and I'm going to pour that inside of my bowl. I know everyone has to measure, so we'll give you a minute for that. If your yeast is not frothy yet, you can give another minute and then you'll catch up with us. I'm sorry, did you already say how much sugar to put in? Nope, so far we did eggs and we just did oil. Got it, thank you. you. you all time, eggs and oil. So we have one egg, we checked that it was kosher, and then we have our quarter cup of oil which we poured in. And there we have our mixture. All right. Then the next thing we're going to get out here is our salt packet. You'll see you have a salt packet and you can dump that right in. So, so far, yeah. I'm so sorry to ask this, but what type of oil? <laughs> you could just use canola oil. I guess vegetable oil is fine. Um, how much oil? We're doing a quarter cup of oil. No problem. For the salt in is- the chat, If you have a question, we have someone monitoring the chat. So we have, let's go through this lady. Let's see how we can do. We have, are cracking our egg. We have one egg that's going inside. Then we have our quarter cup of oil. Next, we have our uh, packet of salt that you have in your um, in your bags. Is avocado oil okay? Um, Paul Scheuer, who is a good friend here, is commenting that we can use any mild oil. Okay. Hi, I did not. I did not get a packet of salt. Um, what? How much salt do we need? A dash, I think is fine. A dash of salt. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I also didn't get a, a salt. So just sure a dash. I'm sorry if you're missing something. Thank God we had hundreds to, to put okay, together. I have salt. <laughs> so something, that's the good thing. Most of the ingredients you have at home. So we're glad. Okay, so we have our egg, oil, salt, and we're moving on to our sugar. You should still have a container of sugar that you only took a tablespoon out of, so you have the rest. If you already accidentally poured it in, then just continue, I guess, without it. So, okay, so we have our sugar container that you have in your um, pack, in your bag, and you can pour that right in. And we're gonna mix everything together. Okay. All right, now the next part is the flour. And for that, we have our pretty and pink flour here. We, could, we would not have given you one with blue or anything. So enjoy that. Um, okay, now we're gonna do three and a half or four cups of flour. How much of the remaining sugar, the whole rest of the quarter cup? Okay, for the flour, I'm going to pour mine in here because it's a small bag and it's hard for me to get my cup inside, but you can use the bag. All right. I'm gonna be getting messy soon, so I'll just put on these. And now you can get a, you're gonna need um, either using a half a cup, measuring cup or a cup and a half a cup. And we're going to add three and a half to four cups of flour. And we're not going to do it all at once. We're going to Start with our first one. Whenever I use, put the flour in, I, I, uh, I level it, so I make sure that I'm putting in the right amount. Um, and then I pour it right in. And you can start mixing. And we're gonna add some of the flour, and then we're gonna mix, and then we're gonna add some more and mix. That's the way it goes. All right. Now it is gonna be very liquidy still. So we're going to add another cup of flour. Any questions, you can ask on the chat. There we go, another cup. And mixing it. So no soap so far, we have two cups of flour in. We need another one and a half to two cups. I have a very hard time remembering how much I put in, especially when there are children around. Um, I lose my focus, so I'm always counting and counting and keeping that in my head. So now we did two cups, we're gonna 
we go on to our third cup and pour it in. And we're gonna mix. Now at this point, you're gonna see that it's starting to turn into more of a dough. So once you get all that mixed in, you could start using your hands to mix. And I just wanna point out that I know it's a lot of fun to add lots of flour, but too much flour is actually gonna make your challah dough really dry. So you wanna have that, that right balance of start off with the three and a half cups. And if you feel you really can't, you can't work with the dough and it's not really a dough, it's way too sticky, then you add slowly until you get to the fourth cup, okay? So I'm gonna get another half a cup so that we're at three and a half. And I'm gonna see if I have enough or do I need more? Here we go. Mixing. Oh my gosh, let out all your stress, guys. This is the time. Okay. We are mixing it in. Three and a half or a little more should be enough. But I do wanna say it all has to do with how exact you were with your oil and with your water, how big your egg was. So that's why we don't have this exact number and you might have to be flexible with your amount of flour. All right, get a little more and mix it up. Here's my dough, feels amazing. All right, if you have a dough, you can pick it up and show me too. I'd love to see yours. Okay, how fun is this? I usually bake challah alone, 300 women. Okay, let's go. So we have, I'm pretty much, my dough is ready, but when the dough is ready, it's not done. Because in order for our challah dough to be fluffy and not, um, not like hard and, and dense, we need to knead it. So we're gonna get our kneading hands out here and get to work. Here's another time where you can get all your stress out, work really hard. When the dough is a bigger dough, when you do like a really big batch, you're gonna be working really hard to get that, that dough. It's gonna, your, your arms are gonna hurt. So you gotta get working here and we're gonna need for just a couple minutes now and then we'll be done our dough. So hopefully everybody's with me. If you have a question, you can write it in the chat. Um, now, people think challah is really hard to make, but the truth is, once you do it, you see the yeast is not so scary, right? The, I always have people, I'm too scared to use yeast. It's really not that scary and it usually works out. So don't be scared to try it again. And you can also use bread flour, which really helps make your dough nice and fluffy. And during this time, it's a good time, you have time to kill. So you can, you know, think of some, uh, blessings that you want because it is a mitzvah to make challah. So it's a good time to think about that. And um, I just wanted to share a quick story about challah that happened to me. So when I was studying in Israel um, about 15 years ago, um, there was someone in my family who needed blessings and we decided to have uh, 40 women bake challah for, for uh, the merit of her having this blessing. So I was in Israel and I did not have, I was studying and I was in a dorm. I didn't have a place to make it. And so I, my aunt lived nearby and I asked her if I can come make it at her house. And she was happy to do that. You can flip over your dough and, and I came by, I made the dough. And then I asked her, I have to go back to class. Uh -huh. So can you, um, can you wash the dough? And when, once it rises, you will take the piece of, separate the piece of challah, make the bracha, and separate the piece of challah, the, 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 take the piece of challah dough, make the bracha, and then you can braid it and put it into the oven. She said, sure thing. She said, I never made challah. I'm thrilled to have this opportunity. So I left. And when I come back, boy, was I surprised. She said, I have to hear the story. I didn't notice it rising at all. And so I just, and so I just put it straight 
I, I did the stuff I was supposed to do. I put it into the oven. I came out. It was hard as a rock. I washed my hands, made a blessing, took a bite, and it was disgusting. And I said, oh my gosh, I feel so bad. She said, you must have used my salt instead of my sugar. So ladies, one tip, salt will kill your dough and will not let it rise. So you want to have a drop of salt and lots of, and lots of, lots of sugar. And this can teach us a good lesson as well, that when you have sweetness and happiness and joy and positivity, then you can accomplish and you can create something amazing. You can do good things. And with that, I think we're good. I think our dough is, can do a little more kneading if you'd like, but I'm going to move on and introduce our next, uh, next up. Um, the Chabad, the Chabad, uh, let's see, the co-director of Chabad of Silver Spring, Chaya Volvaski. Thank you, Mushka. That was great. Um, welcome, everyone. And tonight we are here to celebrate the Jewish woman and specifically in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And while every woman has a story, tonight we will hear from three women who will share their journey and experience with us. I have the great honor of introducing a dear friend, Andrea Wolf. Andrea is a CEO of the Brem Foundation to defeat breast cancer. In this role, she works to maximize every woman's chances of catching early curable breast cancer through education, access program for women in need, and physician education. Andrea started the country's first and only ride sharing program exclusively dedicated to transportation for breast care. Andrea is BRCA positive and had prophylactic mastectomies at age 30. Prior to her current role, Andrea served as the Director of Public Policy for Girls and Company, a national education nonprofit for low income girls. She graduated cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania and received her JD from the George Washington University Law School in 2016. Andrea was chosen as one of the 10 women to watch by Jewish Women International. She lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband and four beautiful daughters, three who have attended the Gan Montessori. Without further ado, I introduce you to our dear friend, Andrea Wolf. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Kaya, for that very generous introduction. I have to say, um, I'm honored to be here with you tonight. I'm particularly honored that Chaya asked me to be here. Uh, as she mentioned, three of my four daughters are the beneficiaries of Chaya's amazing work and all of Chabad. So I want to thank you all for what you do before I get started. As with so many Jewish women, I have a personal reason why I'm doing this work. So I'll tell you a little bit about my story, and then I'll tell you a little bit about our work. Um, so my story actually starts well before I was born in 1970. My grandmother was 33 years old, my mom was 12, and she was diagnosed with breast cancer, and she was told she had six months to live, that she should wrap up her affairs. She had a 13-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a seven-year-old, and that's all they could do. And they, they had some pretty mutilating surgeries back then just to give her a little bit more time, um, and she had those, and she was this beautiful, red-haired, vivacious woman. Well, Hashem was good, and uh, she lived 43 more years. Um, she uh, not only saw her grandchildren, but her great-grandchildren. Um, but this, this uh, moment had a profound impact on her daughter, my mom, who, like I said, was 12. My mom then went to medical school um, and became a radiologist specializing only in breast imaging. I have to believe, I don't think she ever put it together, but I believe because of what happened when she was 12. So she became a very prominent doctor focusing entirely on helping women uh, with breast cancer. But when she was, well, and one thing she used to do in her practice is she would try out new equipment on herself to decide what to buy for her patients. And so one night um, after her patients went home, she was trying out a new piece of equipment and she found her own breast cancer. She was 37 and I was 12. So history was repeating itself a little bit. Um, she had chemotherapy and surgeries and it was actually right before my bat mitzvah and I only subsequently learned she wore this gorgeous dress and I only subsequently learned that she still had bandages on and she was going through chemo we actually as kids never realized quite what was going on because she was so stoic 
So she, thank God, did fine. Um, and she is still the, bre the head of the breast center at GW today, practicing as a physician. Um, but I knew with that family history that I had some serious risk here. And so when I was 22 years old, I got tested for the BRCA gene. And of course I was positive. It was really no surprise to me, um, but I really wanted to make a plan because I did not want to be the third generation of women in their 30s to get this disease. So I had my first two daughters, Eliana and Lerone. Um, and then at age 30, I decided I, I didn't want to worry about this anymore. I was sure I was going to get it. And so I had prophylactic mastectomies and then went on to have my second two daughters, Neshama and Michal. Um, and that wasn't really where it stopped because I joined the board of this organization, uh, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And they had no staff at the time uh, and eventually approached me and said, we're either at where we're going to be, we're going to plateau and this is it, or we need to hire somebody to run this. And I said, okay, let's find somebody to run this. And they said, well, what about you running it? And so here I am five years later, um, running this amazing organization. And, um, you know, Hashem is good and Hashem is also funny in ways. So I have two sisters and four daughters. Um, so we are a very girl heavy family. And I'm hoping very much that some of the work that we're doing at the Brem Foundation and here together at this hollow bake will make it that my four daughters and all of your daughters have different options than we all did. Speaking of, she's here. Go to bed. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the Brem Foundation. The Brem Foundation is a nonprofit based out of DC uh, and we focus entirely on the early detection of breast cancer. Why? Because breast cancer is a really well-marketed disease, right? it would be hard to find anybody in this country who doesn't recognize what the pink ribbon stands for. And yet with all that publicity, women and men, frankly, don't get the real like talkless information about what they need to know to save their own lives. So the Brem Foundation maximizes women's chances of finding curable breast cancer through education, access and physician training. The education um, is, well, let me back up a step and tell you that the Brem Foundation is actually named for my mom. And it was started not by my mom, but by a bunch of patients who were inspired by the way she practices medicine. And so uh, my mom and I together created a uh, very unique and very effective education program that we, um, that we give for women of all communities, all socioeconomic backgrounds, everyone. And people will often come in thinking they know everything there is to know because they're tired of hearing about breast cancer in the media and they leave shocked. Um, and so we really are saving lives through this education. But we also realize that education is only as good as the tests that a woman can access. And so we have two access programs, um, primarily for lower income communities. One is the B Fund and the other is Wheels for Women. The B Fund is actually a fund for women um, for, to pay for their diagnostic tests. A lot of people don't realize that a screening mammogram does not tell you whether you have breast cancer. It only tells you whether you have an abnormality in your breast. If you do, then you need a diagnostic test. Well, screening mammograms are free, but diagnostic tests are not. And so there's a whole cohort of women that go and diligently get their screening mammograms and then have an abnormality and can't pay for that diagnostic test. Now imagine for a minute what that feels like, right? You're told you have an abnormal mammogram, you're told it might be breast cancer, but you're also told you can't really afford to know whether it's breast cancer or not. So it's pretty torturous for people if they can't. So we team up with nonprofits to help women who can't afford those tests get them within two weeks of their abnormal mammogram. The other thing like Chaya mentioned is that we partnered with Lyft to create the country's first and only cost-free ride sharing program so that people who can't afford or access transportation can get back and forth for free for breast care. Now, this is obviously a Jewish crowd. So I wanna take one moment and mention things that are specific to us. Ashkenazi Jewish women have a much higher chance of getting breast cancer. And part of that is because we have a much higher incidence of the BRCA gene. Um, BRCA is a, uh, actually a mutation in a gene that would otherwise catch cells that are uh, proliferating abnormally and sort of eat them, but the, the mutation makes it so that they don't get identified. 
So the Brown Foundation realized that a lot of people need genetic testing and we have a relationship with color genomics. Um, if you haven't been tested for BRCA and for actually a whole panel of cancer genes, uh, I would be happy to help you do that. Uh, with color, we have a discount if you use BREM and all uh, you have to do is spit in a tube and send it in the mail. Um, so in short, I want to uh, remind everybody of a couple things. One is get screened based on your personal risk factors. Two is don't let COVID prevent you from get, getting screening. And three is if you have any other questions, I'd be more than happy to talk to you um, privately. My email is andrea at bremfoundation.org. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. And I, I'm getting a lot of requests. If you can post on the chat, the um, link to contact you or your organization, I think that'll be greatly beneficial. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce an amazing woman. She is a 49 year old self-proclaimed domestically challenged, I did not say that about her, she said this about herself, wife to Howard and mother to 19 year old daughter Zoe, beautiful Zoe, hi Zoe, and 17 year old son Brady, born in New York, raised in South Florida, and now a proud Potomac resident for almost 20 years, when not saving the Montgomery County moms and kids from fashion faux pas at Cloud9, on, at on Cloud9, she can be found saving the world one necklace at a time through a co-owned jewelry business, Jimmy, I'm gonna say it wrong, you'll tell us how to say it, Jessica, okay. Jimmy Jewelry. And I do wanna say when I met Jessica, first time, I had no idea of, of Jessica's story, and I just see this beautiful woman with a gorgeous short haircut, so I just complimented her. I'm like, I have to say, I love your hair. And then the story began. So please welcome the beautiful Jessica. And I had the honor of also knowing her amazing daughter, Zoe. But welcome, Jessica, to this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, for putting this all together. And thank you, everybody, for supporting this very important cause. My breast cancer story began in April of 2015. I felt a pretty sizable lump above my right breast and made an appointment with my gynecologist who was actually unavailable at the time. I was assured by her PA with her 90% confidence that because the lump hurt and because it moved, it was not to be worried about. She said, let's wait, we're gonna wait, let's see what happens with your next cycle and see if it will resolve itself. A few weeks later, I called back to let them know that the lump was still there and was sent in for a sonogram and a mammogram. Once again, the mammogram was clear with no evidence of anything. As I sat through the sonogram, the technician also assured me that there was nothing that she could see and her findings were just that of a normal breast and normal breast tissue. I literally took her hand, I put it on this lump that was about the size of a small apple and said, can you feel this? She said, of course I can feel this, but I've seen it before and it's appearing as normal tissue. So you wanna believe what the doctors say. And I let my guard down for a couple weeks, but soon enough, the lump started to get a little bigger. So within the next two weeks, literally if I raised my arms above my head, I could see this lump protruding in the mirror. So I called back the gynecologist and she sent me in for an MRI. Had an MRI, two hours later, the phone rang. Now I'm suddenly listening to her tell me that this is clearly cancer and it's also infiltrated my lymph node. So that was the first night that I cried. Fear of the unknown, fear of what's going to be in my future. The next and the last time I cried during this process was after the PET scan revealed that it was isolated to just my breast and my lymph node. I knew what I was facing and we celebrated that news. My treatment included 20 weeks of chemotherapy followed by a double mastectomy and then five weeks of radiation. As my treatment began and my family and I began to process all that the diagnosis entailed and all that we had ahead of us, our community, and specifically my neighborhood, suffered an unimaginable loss of two children in the Wooten car accident. The accident immediately made me and my family recognize and completely appreciate the fact that we would function as a full family unit, unlike these poor families who had just lost their children. I recognize that my cancer, while of course life-changing, 
was temporary and how thankful I was to be in this together as a complete family. So from there, we saw ourselves truly as fortunate. Hannah had asked me how this had impacted my faith and life. Through this process, I have a newfound faith in, community, in our community. This community was my army and supported me, supported my husband and supported my children in countless ways. From my group of already close friends to people I didn't even know at all, the outreach from everyone was unbelievable and indispensable. This community was a safety net of reassurance and strength. Even today, years later, truly, as I walk down the street or wherever I am, people with genuine concern ask me how my health is. It's really amazing. I have two messages I'd like to share. Number one, always be your own advocate. Nobody knows your body better than you do and trust your gut. The second is more of a little story that serves as a constant reminder of strength. In September, 2016, so just a little bit over a year from when it started and my final, after my final reconstruction surgery, I was finally res ready to visit Vinnie Myers, who is the infinite, infamous nipple tattoo god. Aside my original tumor location, I had the word unbreakable tattooed with a pink ribbon. It's a daily reminder to me that my spirit, my family and my strength are unbreakable. And we as women and our community are also unbreakable. Thank you all for listening. And again, thank you so much, Hana, for putting this all together. Thank you so much, Jessica. And I really love how you spoke about your faith and how the community gets together. And it's clear tonight that that is the case. I would now like to introduce a very dear friend, Carrie Suisa. Carrie is a local emergency medicine physician. She is humbled to share her, her journey with you and would like to dedicate her talk in honor of her cherished family and friends who nourished her body and soul during her own battle with breast cancer. She prays that Hashem should watch over you and your families as you have watched over her, as you have watched over hers. And Carrie, we pray for your continued health and everybody else here tonight. Please welcome Carrie Suiza. Thank you. All right, well, I hope everybody can hear me. I wanna start by thanking the Chabad Rebbitzins for organizing today's virtual Pink Challah Bake. I also wanna thank everyone on Zoom for carving out the time to participate. In November, 2018, when I received an email a few days after my 3D mammogram, informing me that the study did not detect any cancer, I wasn't really surprised. I remember barely taking the time to read the entirety of the message. Like most of you, I was too busy and pressed for time to allow for any disruption in my normal routine. Ignoring the fact that I had a key risk factor for breast cancer, being female, I reassured myself that even though I was Ashkenazi, I was BRCA negative, had no family history of breast cancer, and was in the best shape of my life. The fact that 75% of women diagnosed with breast cancer have no family history didn't have the same meaning for me as it does today. The one out of every eight women statistic, well, that was a fact that had largely impacted my professional world, but not my personal one. As an emergency medicine physician, I treated many women and some men for complications of breast cancer. I'd always done my best to sympathize with the patients and made every effort to attend to their needs while they were under my care. Unfortunately, seemed to, um, with the chaotic emergency department, I never really had the chance to appreciate their individual journeys as cancer patients. Several months after that November mammogram, while performing a monthly breast self-exam, I felt a lump in my left breast. I had no pain associated with it. I decided that it must be related to fibrocystic changes, even though I had no history of fibrocystic breasts. There was nothing to be concerned about, of course, given my normal study just a few months before. The next month, I felt the same lump, but this time I noticed some dimpling along the outer aspect of my left breast, close to my armpit. I decided that I should probably mention this to my gynecologist. Several days later, I went for a repeat mammogram. After the mammogram, while I was still in the dressing room, the technician told me 
that the radiologist wanted to review the images with me. Given that we were colleagues, I took this only as a friendly collegial gesture. I sat down in the darkened reading room and without being a radiologist, I could see very clearly that the April 2019 image looked nothing like the November 2018 one. It was almost as if two different women were on the screen, but both images belonged to me. The radiologist was so concerned that he ordered a same day ultrasound to further assess the findings on the mammogram. The ultrasound was quickly followed by a biopsy. During the biopsy, I asked the radiologist, are you concerned? Her reply stung. In less than 24 hours, I was diagnosed with invasive lobular carcinoma of the left breast. Five months after my mammogram, not only did I have cancer, but it had spread. So I wanna share two important takeaway points as well. Screening mammograms save lives. I'm gonna say that again, screening mammograms save lives. While it did not detect my cancer, they can and do detect early cancers in many women. And we know that the earlier we diagnose breast cancer, the greater the survival rate. Make time for your mammogram. But like all studies, as we just heard, mammography has limitations. Every exam has limitations. Nothing is 100%, nothing is foolproof. Which takes me to point number two. It is essential that you become an expert in your body. 40% of all breast cancers are discovered by women themselves. I guarantee you that no matter how many years physicians study, no matter how many exams they take, no one will be more of an expert on what is normal or not normal for your body than you. Also, remember that women in their 20s and 30s who have been or will be diagnosed with breast cancer are younger than the recommended age for mammography. So unless we encourage younger women to become familiar with their breasts, we'll lose an opportunity to protect our daughters, granddaughters, sisters, friends, and nieces. Many women worry that they don't know how to perform a correct breast self-exam. I'm here to tell you that pretty much any breast self-exam you do is amazing. Do it your way, try to be consistent. Once a month, examine and feel your breasts. Look in the mirror. If your right breast has grown noticeably bigger than your left, say something. If you have discharge from your left nipple, say something. If your right nipple is pointing down when it used to point straight ahead, say something. Even if it's one day, one week, or one month after your mammogram. Remember, you are the expert. And it is only when you combine your body expertise with your physician's medical expertise that you optimize your healthcare. That also is important, so I'm gonna repeat it one more time. It is only when you combine your body expertise with your physician's medical expertise that you optimize your healthcare. As you can imagine, it's impossible to summarize a brutal 18 month journey in just a few minutes. I can only promise that if you have any questions, any comments, any concerns after this, I will always make myself available to you. Finally, I pray that Hashem keeps you and your family healthy. If God forbid you become ill, this evening is proof that there's a robust and committed army of women that will lift you up and carry you and your family on their shoulders. You are not alone. If you need us, we will show up, whether it is to dob in for you, drive you to appointments, or arrange a food train. We will make it happen, and I will be the first in line. Thank you. Wow, that was truly inspiring and uplifting, and we are so grateful to each of you for sharing your message here, your message of hope, resistance, and faith. Please welcome Zahava Pinson, well-known singer all the way from Melbourne, Australia. Zahava will sing a song that gives the message of faith and hope in God, in faith and hope in Hashem, in God through difficult times. Zahava, all the way from Australia. Hi everyone, it is so great to be here. Thank you all for your beautiful words. All the way from Melbourne, Australia. It's actually daytime here, but uh, for you it's night. So tonight I will be singing Kol Ha'olam Kulo, a song which 
speaks of having hope and faith during challenging times, that even though life can feel like a very narrow bridge, we are not afraid because God is with us. Please feel free to join in if you, have, if you know the song um, or just clap or even dance along. Get <laughs> The whole world is a very narrow bridge, a very narrow bridge, a very narrow bridge. In the whole world is a very narrow bridge, a very narrow bridge. And the main thing is to recall is to have no fear, to have no fear at all. And the main thing is to recall is to have no fear at all. Geshet the whole world is a very narrow bridge, a very narrow bridge, a very narrow bridge. The whole world is a very narrow bridge, yes, a very narrow bridge. Two, three, four, so much. I'd now like to turn the stage to Rachel Bitton. Hi Rachel. Hi everybody. Rachel. I'm just going to share my screen. Rachel is an outstanding Rachel. chef from Silver yeah. Spring. All the beautiful ladies here who will share a delicious and nutritious pink hummus recipe. Rachel take it away. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. That was really beautiful Zahava. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay, great. And you can see my screen? Excellent. 
welcome everybody welcome to all the beautiful people here this is this is a lot of fun i'm glad we're doing this together um i'm just gonna get this started here so i'd like to first introduce myself my name is rachel vito uh, my partner dawn and i have been running kosher sustenance for the past three years um a few Adjectives I would use to describe our catering and personal chef services are kosher, authentic, Mediterranean, unique, healthy, fresh, and tasty. <laughs> so I just read this quote last week. Um, I have a very close friend in Israel who's just an inspirational life coach and she posts really beautiful things. And I read this and um, I wanted to share it with you because I thought it was very appropriate. Um, I expect to pass through this world but once. Any good therefore that I can do or any kindness I can show to any fellow creature, let me do it now. Let me not defer or neglect it for I shall not pass this way again. Sir William Penn. So um, I just think, first of all, the, right when I read this quote, I thought of all of you Chabad ladies, okay? This epitomizes your, your zlizut um, le mitzvah. You always are like hurrying and, and jumping forth to do good deeds constantly. So that was the first thing I thought of. But um, I also sort of thought of my experience. I'm a stage three breast cancer survivor. And I was diagnosed um, when I was 37 years old. I was just going to my annual uh, well women's checkup. So it was just my annual pap smear. Um, my doctor did a manual exam and she found a lump in my left breast. So uh, from that day, within three weeks, I was on the operating table and had a double mastectomy and I went through chemo and I went through radiation and I went through reconstruction. And the point is that I was gonna be damned if it was gonna get me down, <laughs> okay? So, you know, I was gonna go through this way. I realized that I was going through this. I realized that, you know, um, I was gonna be going through this experience and I was gonna be doing it with a smile on my face. <laughs> so, um, this is actually a picture of me um, at my last Herceptin treatment. I'm actually wearing a pink skirt, how appropriate. <laughs> um, I um, have a big smile on my face because the doctor also approved the removal of my port that day. This was it, it was the last time I was gonna be hooked up to this, to this machine and I was just really happy. And um, I went through my whole treatment with a big fat smile on my face. And I think it made a difference to everyone I met, to every nurse that treated me, to every doctor I met with, to every tech in the hospital. Um, it just, you know, I, I was so laser beam focused on the end. This picture, in fact, was exactly what I was focused on the day I found out I had cancer. I knew I was going to get through it. I knew there was not a question. And in fact, it was a very big inconvenience for me. And, uh, you know, I run my own business. I have five children. I have a busy life. I love to live. And the fact that I found out I had cancer was just not part of my plan or schedule. And I told my doctor right away, just tell me what I need to do and where I need to be to eliminate this. I, I just need to get this behind me. So this photo really... Uh, like epitomizes the whole um, experience because I was so focused on just getting through it and reaching the end. Um, of course, I call this my five reasons slide. <laughs> um, of course, I had so much to um, live for. And so I, I uh, these are my five wonderful children. And so they, they were a big driving force in um, my recovery. So as I mentioned earlier, when I said that quote, 
it also thought uh, it also made me think of the concept in Judaism called zrizin makdimim le mitzvot, rush to do a mitzvah, rush like you know you should you should just don't wait, don't hesitate, you know take advantage of the opportunity when you have a chance to do something good for someone, it multiplies itself into into and it reaches people that good deed multiplies itself and so it really just spreads goodness and so um now what i'd like to do i don't know if you all realize this but besides this being this awesome great pink hug big zoom it's also a dance party and we're about to have a 20 second dance party and everyone's going to be joining with me Okay, can you remember the days when we used to hold hands and we used to dance together in circles and hug and kiss and be happy in our simchas? Those days are coming very, very soon. Those days will come back soon. We're going to be together and dancing and celebrating. So right now, I am going to start. Welcome to our 22nd dance party. Can you hear the music? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good job everybody who participated. That's awesome. <laughs> I wanted to see how many people would get into it, and I'm glad you did. And now that we're warmed up, um, we are going to make our pink hummus. Okay, so now for some pink hummus. Um, Chaya called me and was like, Rachel, what can we do? Pink, pink, pink. And I was looking and looking, looking. And I saw this amazing recipe for roasted beet hummus. The recipe is up on your screen. If you have the ingredients, great. If you don't, that's fine too. Really, it's a simple recipe to make. And you don't need to see like what I'm doing here so much as know that you just put everything into the food processor, blend it up and make pink hummus. It's pink obviously from the small uh, roasted beet. Um, two tips I just wanna give you on making hummus. We make hummus almost every week here. Um, two tips I wanna give you, okay? So I, I have my food processor here in front of me and I am gonna show you the ingredients, but um, when you blend the chickpeas, okay? so. It says a can of chickpeas here, but I soaked, I have chickpeas soaking in my kitchen almost, almost every day. So we use a lot of chickpeas in our kitchen. So, um, you know, I have them, I cook them and they're still hot. And so blending them when they're hot makes a big difference. So when you're making hummus, and even if you're using a can, you can just take the can, rinse them, and boil them in water so that they're hot, strain them, and then add them to the food processor, makes a really nice consistency, okay? So I'm adding my chickpeas to the food processor, okay? Um, it says one small roasted beet. I happen to have um, beets that I boiled and, and grated right here. So I'm actually gonna add a quarter cup, and if you wanna take that note to modify the recipe, you can. I'm adding a quarter cup of um, a beet that I just boiled and peeled and then grated, okay? Uh, zest of a lemon, I'm adding zest of a lemon to my food processor. Um, some salt and pepper, so I like to use white pepper when I make, uh, when I make um, hummus, I always use white pepper, I just feel it works better um, than the black pepper, the black pepper doesn't isn't ground as finely. I'm adding my salt. I'm adding my cumin and the tahina, literally everything except for the oil. So if you have the if you have the ingredients in front of you, everything except for the oil goes into the food processor and my lemon juice. And yes, I am squeezing a lemon. Come on, ladies, get those arms moving some elbow grease in the kitchen, no shortcuts here. Use the fresh lemon, makes a big, big difference. <laughs> and it's only a half a lemon, okay? So I'm gonna squeeze it and add it, okay? 
my food prep sister right here in front of me, and two minced garlic cloves. Here's another great little tip. Um, this little, this, when, whenever I need minced garlic cloves, especially for a salad dressing or something like this, where I want to make sure the reason why I'm mincing it before I put it in the food processor is because I don't want to, I want to make sure it's really fine and it blends into the hummus. Sometimes in the food processor it might just end up as little chunks. But this tool I love, I use it all the time when I make salad dressings. You can get it at your local Asian market. It's like this little plate, it's plastic, and it has these sharp little teeth on it. Not that sharp, I can touch them, but it's got these grooves and you take your garlic clove and you literally just rub it against those and it very easily turns your, um, see, can you see that? How it very easily turns your garlic clove into the perfect texture for salad dressings, for marinades, for hummus, okay? So love this tool. They sell it at Asian markets everywhere. So that's my other tip here. I'm adding, I'm just gonna add my uh, garlic, okay? And now as I'm blending it, turning pink it's already turning pink and the third tip i'm going to tell you so blend the chickpeas when they're hot grate your garlic on this cool grater tool find it you know at your local asian market um olive oil then gets drizzled in slowly just like if you were making a salad dressing and you want it to come out creamy when you emulsify the oil it it, it, it when you blend it really quickly it makes the hummus extra creamy. So the last part is the quarter cup of oil, which I'm gonna put here into my one second. Is anyone there making a long hummus along with me? And now let me show you our pink <laughs> It's still hot. Actually, in Israel as well, like if you sit in a, a authentic little local neighborhood restaurant and you order hummus, they serve it hot. It's, it's, it's actually supposed to be hot. So here's our pink hummus. Look how smooth and creamy it is. Makes a huge difference. And next, I'm going to pass it off to Mechani Garzinski, Chabar Bethesda. Okay, hello ladies. Thank you so much, Rachel. That looks delicious. Can't wait to try our own. Um, we're going to move on here with the program and um, we are about to continue with our challah. Before we're gonna actually say the bracha on the challah, we're going to pause for a moment, possibly one of the you know, most important parts of this whole challah baking um, for a moment of prayer. Um, we know that in general, when a woman performs her three special mitzvot of taking challah, of lighting the Shabbat candles, and, and of harmony, bringing harmony into the Jewish home, um, it says the gates of heaven are open to her, and any type of prayers on behalf of family, friends, um, at that moment, God is there and, you know, listening to her personal prayers. And so we can imagine if that's a woman on her own making challah, how powerful it must be having hundreds of women here gathered tonight from all different communities. And so we're, we're each at this point going to um, have in mind all those women that we know that are currently suffering from breast cancer, um, as well as any other people that you know that are in need of any type of prayers or blessing, be it the pandemic or anything else that's, um, you know, that people are suffering with. We're gonna keep those names in mind. And if there's somebody on that list that you're, we have women who sent in a lot of names. So we have a whole bunch of names here. You can keep in mind any other name that is not on the list and just have it in mind as, um, as we recite, we're gonna recite chapter, Psalm 20 of Psalms um, right, after, right after we scroll down the names. So just give a moment to all these um, women here on the screen.
Okay, please join me as we recite now Psalm 20. We're gonna sing, we're gonna say that together now up on the screen. Psalm 20 is set aside a, a special psalm for those in need, especially for healing. And so we'll all have in mind all those who need it as we say the psalm together. For the conductor, a psalm by David. May the Lord answer you on the day of distress. May the name of the God of Jacob fortify you. May he send your help from the sanctuary and support you from, from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and always accept favorably your sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill your every counsel. We will rejoice in your deliverance and raise our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord, may the Lord fulfill all your wishes. Now I know that the Lord has delivered his anointed one, answering him from his holy heavens with the mighty saving power of his right hand. Some rely upon chariots and some upon horses, but we rely upon and invoke the name of the Lord our God. They bend and fall, but we rise and stand, for, and stand firm. Lord, deliver us. May the king answer us on the day we call. Amen. Amen. Moving right back to our music, musical performance. Hine matov umanaim shevet achim gam yachad. How good and pleasant it is when we sit together as one. And even though we are not physically together, our hearts and minds are one. Through unity, love, and kindness, we can achieve great things. Please join in with me.
God bless you all. Hannah Reichik, co-director of Chabad of Upper Montgomery Country, will lead us now in fulfilling the mitzvah of Hafrash Abkhala, separating a piece of the dough while saying a special blessing. Okay, so we're Montgomery County, everyone. We're now a country, okay? That's good. I like that. Um, so now I am going to make a bracha on the challah. As you can see, mine is a lot bigger than what you did because in order to make a bracha, someone does have to use um, at least 12 cups of flour in the recipe. So I use quite a few more than that. So after I say the bracha, you can again think of people who you would like blessings for. So I put my hand on the dough, I cover it so it's one big piece and I say the bracha and then I will lift up the dough. This dough is going to be burnt in the oven. It is not eaten in the time of the temple of the holy temple. It was given to the uh, priests. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kiddushanu b'mitzvaysa v'tzivanu lahafrish chala. Zohi chala. And now I would like to turn the floor over to Goldie Pearlstein, co-director of Chabad of Greater Gainesville and Manassas, who will lead us in the fun part of braiding challah. Hello, everyone. Um, okay, so um, over here, I have my dough. It got nice and large um, and it was resting. And I am going to show you today how to braid two different types of challah. This is really exciting. We will have, I'll show you over here. We'll have a beautiful one Goldie, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. I don't know why. Sorry. Okay. We'll re redo our introduction. Um, Okay, we're going to be making beautiful challah. This is uh, very exciting. We're going to make a one braid challah. Uh, yours is going to, if you divide yours in half, yours will become bigger um, and a beautiful four braid challah. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take our beautiful dough that rested and kind of, you know, almost doubled in size from what it was before. We'll divide it in half and um, we'll take one of the halves and divide that into four. One of them is going to be a, just a one strand, so we'll just need a full, a full one, and the other one we're going to divide into four. And what we're going to do with that is now we're going to roll it kind of into a rope, into a long rope. You can do it with me right now. I have my one. We'll start with the one strand of, of challah, and we'll shape it out. You just want to start from the middle, roll it kind of like into a long rope. As you go, you can go out roll it out and it comes kind of nice and large. You want it to become a nice, large rope, okay? So we're gonna roll it out into a nice, large rope. And if you are with me and you have your nice, large rope, you can give me a thumbs up so that I can see. And I'll show you how to braid this. This is a really, I, this is one of my, my one of, two of my favorite ways to braid challah. I love making challah. Um, put your rope the long way. And the first thing that you're going to need to do is kind of make a lowercase d. With your challah, you're going to make a, a lowercase d. And, um, Sorry, I'm gonna make a lowercase d. Take the top part of your dough, the top of the d, and bring it into your dough all the way to the right, okay? So I have my lowercase d, I take the top of it, bring it into my dough, and diagonally bring it all the way to the right. I'm gonna take my circular part, and I'm gonna kind of flip it, fold it in towards me, and kind of gives me, it gives it like an eight shape, kind of looks like an eight. And I'll take the extra part of my dough and bring it 
inside. And there you have a beautiful challah. I'll do it one more time for you. We have over here a beautiful piece of dough. I'm going to make my lowercase d. Take the top of it, bring it in diagonally to the right. Take my O, make it into an eight, flip it towards me. And then bring this extra little strand and tuck it inside the dough for a beautiful, beautiful challah, okay? Now, if you have that, if you have those two, if you have the challah, now you can take your other four balls and start rolling them out into ropes as well, okay? We'll roll our other four challahs into four long ropes. Get our hands rolling. I see some people rolling it up. That's okay too. That's great too. You can roll it however you like. You want to get four nice long ropes. And we are going to make a beautiful, beautiful challah. This is one of my favorite types of challahs to make, one of my favorite braids. And if you have your four, you have your four ropes. You are going to kind of pinch it on the top. And actually what we're gonna do, I'm gonna just move these two on the side. I'm actually gonna bring them up, kind of making it like an X, okay? So I have on my four, my four ropes, I have a right top corner, a right bottom corner, a left top corner, and a left bottom corner. And the way that this braid works is I'm just going to swap the bottom for the top and then the, and the top for the bottom on either side and I'm gonna switch from one side to the next. So I'll start with, over here, I'll start with the, um, the top left and I'm gonna swap it for the bottom right. So I put the top left down and the bottom right up. And now I'm gonna do the other side. Right top down, bottom left up, okay? And that's kind of how you do it. You do diagonal, you're just going to swap it. Bottom goes up, up goes down. Okay, bottom goes up, up goes down. And we're just gonna continue doing that. Bottom goes up, up goes down. 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 And we're gonna continue doing it. Bottom goes up, up goes down until we kind of like pinch the ends together, and we have a beautiful, beautiful challah, okay? Now, once you have your beautiful challah, once you have your beautiful challah, you'll take an egg. We're gonna check it again for blood. And you're gonna get, you're gonna blaze your egg. You have a beautiful inside your kit. You have a beautiful sala brush. You're gonna whip up that egg. I actually love adding a little bit of vanilla sugar or honey to my egg mixture. And you're gonna take it, you're gonna glaze your kala, and then you have a cute, so you have pink sprinkles, you can do that for breast cancer awareness. You can put any type of toppings that you like, everything but the bagel spice, cinnamon sugar, uh, gar minced garlic, dried minced garlic, and you'll preheat your oven now to about 375. You'll let your challah rise for about a half hour, 45 minutes. 
and then you'll put it inside um, for about 40 for, for about a half hour. Check on it until it's golden brown and you'll have a lovely kala for your Shabbat table. Thank you. Um, okay. And now we're gonna move right along to my great friend and colleague, Connor, um, Connor Rachik, all the way from Upper Montgomery County, who will show us the ultimate pink Shabbat table. Connor, okay. So I'm just gonna share my screen for one minute. I know we're a little bit late, so I'm gonna be super quick. I'm going to show you a picture of how I set my table, and then I will just show you how I folded the napkin. And you guys all should have gotten um, these gorgeous pink flower napkins and these shirt mints and everything. So you'll be using all of these things to set your table, and we will all have matching tables this week, which is amazing in the theme of unity and, and being together and supporting each other. Um, so I'm just going to show you very quickly. All right. So this is how I set my table. I just use things that I find around my house. The idea is think out of the box. So instead of using a vase, I use teapots to put the flowers in, layer things, put things on top of each other, like putting the colors, one leaning on the other, it adds dimension, it adds height, it makes your table look beautiful. Um, and just like search around your house, find a wooden board, find a placemat, layer things on top of each other, use your flowers differently than how you would think you would. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen now, but if you want the picture, for a little bit of inspiration, you can ask me or your Kabad Rebetzin and she'll send it to you. Um, and I'll just show you how I folded the napkin. Really, really simple. Literally, you just open it into a big square. I'm sure you all know how to do it. And you pinch it from the middle. So you get like a little flower and then you can use anything as a napkin holder. I used a pink elastic. Um, and you tie it. And then I just stuck a white flower inside. I'll show you the one I already have. You know, add a little bit of dimension again. Um, and you have a beautiful Shabbat table just by using what you have, using what you got. Um, Shabbat is a very feminine day. We refer to it as the Shabbat queen. So it's all about femininity and beauty. And I hope you all take pictures before Shabbat of your beautiful chalas and your tables. And I think um, Khana Kaplan will tell you the hashtag that you can put on social media so that we all get to see your pictures. And with that, I'll hand it back to her. Thank you, everybody. I'm just going to wrap up by thanking once again all my Chabad colleagues, friends, slash now family for pulling this night together. Thanking all of our speakers, Andrea, Carrie, Rachel, Jessica, Zahava, my dear first cousin, all the way from down under for entertaining us tonight. This was incredible. The unity from the community blew our minds. So thank you for joining. And I want to just point out one thing. I'm giving you the best homework ever, and that is that I we, not I, we gave you a beautiful challah guide inside your kit. And that is to help you have a beautiful Shabbat dinner. Now you know how to set the table. Now you have a challah. All you need to do is look at the book and it'll give you the kiddush and it'll tell you how to light Shabbat candles. We even gave you the candles. So I wanted to enjoy that. And before candle lighting, I'm actually not sure what time candle lighting is tomorrow night. So maybe someone wants to post it in the chat. Before candle lighting or tomorrow when your table is set or when your challah is ready, take a picture. If you do happen to have social media, Post it on social media with hashtag Great Pink Chala Bake because this is the Great Pink Chala Bake. You are all great. You are all amazing. Stay healthy, stay safe, stay sane, stay fun. And most important, enjoy your Shabbos because it's the most relaxing day of the week for as much as you can. And thank you all. If anybody has any questions, post it on the chat before we close it because when I close it, it, then you all go back to your own little worlds. So Shabbat Shalom. Have a Great night. And again, thank you all for joining. Good night.
Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Shabbat Shalom. Mm -hmm. It's so fun baking with you all. Thank you for joining. Candle lighting is 551. Getting earlier. Thank you, everybody. I see the numbers going down. Do, 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 do. Send, us, send us pictures of your challahs. You want to see them. With you inside. Selfie with the challah. Yes. Play your pink hummus. see those braids. How they look. Pink hummus. Oh, pink hummus. I'm making the pink hummus. Can't wait. <laughs> Can't wait. Healthy and pretty. What's better? Rachel, put I'll spotlight you. Put it on so we can see. There we go. Oh, wow. <gasps> yeah. I was about to grab my fresh parsley. I reserved the Beautiful. chickpeas just to plate it. So you put the chickpeas, sprinkle some sesame seeds, black and white, drizzle olive oil like this, and then just give it some uh, yeah. parsley. Yeah. So pretty. Yeah. Did you take Did you take yeah. a spoon yeah. to make that indent yeah. in the yeah. internal? Yeah. 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 When you plate hummus, you take a big piece of it. Our password. Get to see an extra treat. You have to see how to do it. She's too good. This is how you plate hummus, okay? So here's my picture. And that's how it is. Delicious. Take a big heaping spoon mm -hmm. you just dollop it right in the middle of the plate okay right in the middle I'm actually even okay big dollop just like that right in the middle of the plate then you take the back of your spoon and you just spread it around like this this is actually like a real show like in the hummus restaurants you, the guy is like holding the plate like half sideways flipping it over and he's and that's it. And you make a little well, and then you garnish it with whatever you want, sesame seeds. You could even put a little shredded beets in the middle so, so it indicates that it's pink from the beets. Here's a little olive oil. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Oh, all right. Love that. Now I'll be like a chef. Can't wait. <laughs> chef Rachel. Thank you. All right, good night. I'm going to end meeting for all unless there's one last question. I'll wait another minute and then we will say Shabbat Shalom, Laila Tov. Wear pink lipstick. <laughs> all right, good night, everybody. I'm going to see where the end all is. Good night. Oh, here it is. Good night, good night. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you again. Bye. Bye.